We're about to see big changes to our cultural values, collective ideals and dreams, and the kind of people, movements and works of art that capture our imagination. That's because Neptune, the planet that signifies our visions of the ideal and relationship with the transcendent, is about to undergo a huge shift from Pisces, the last sign of the zodiac, to Aries, the first. Neptune moved into Pisces in 2011 to 12, and it's hard to overestimate just how much the world and our everyday lives have changed since then. This was the era when the social media powered smartphone colonized the planet, boundaries dissolved, and we found ourselves all swimming in the same illusory waters, a technological realm of instant connection in which image was everything. We saw new ideologies and worldviews, big shifts in how people talk about things like gender and sexuality, and explosions in the use of psychedelics and mystical practices of all kinds. But the Neptune in Pisces era is about to end, and from the spring of 2025, Neptune will begin its transition into Aries. This is a huge shift, and it's one that has implications for all of us. But what are they? Well, the last time Neptune was in Aries was between 1861 and 1875. For the US, that included the Civil War period and the abolition of slavery in that country. But of course, there was much more at work at the time. In this episode, we're going to think about what Neptune in Pisces has signified in the world and what its move into Aries is likely to bring. But I won't be doing this work alone. In this episode, I'll be joined by a very special guest, one I'm particularly delighted to have on the channel because he's one of my own teachers. He's the writer, astrologer, and astrological educator, Adam Ellenbass. Adam is an expert in Hellenistic astrology, among other things, and his courses help students apply ancient teachings to the modern world, infused with a heavy dose of deep spiritual insight. So who better to understand a planet we closely associate with the spiritual realm as it makes the shift from the end of the zodiac to its beginning. I think about the potential for this to just ignite our awareness of the fact that the Earth is more than we think it is, that the cosmos is more than we think it is, and for that to have this very illuminating effect that could also catalyze a lot of new thinking and new developments. If all that sounds good to you, then please do join me, Dan Waits, for another journey into the past to understand the present and the future. If you're enjoying this video so far, then please do click that like button and let the YouTube algorithm and me know that. And if you're keen to avoid missing future episodes, then hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and even enable notifications so YouTube alerts you when I drop a new video. And if you really like what I do, then you could think about going even further than that and signing up as a member of World Astrology Report at www.worldastrologyreport.com. And there's a lot in it for you, should you decide to sign up. Firstly, I have all of my videos uploaded on the site and you can watch them without ads. And all of my episodes since I launched the member site have had exclusive members only versions with juicy additional material. In these extended episodes, I go deeper into history and technique. So this option is perfect for those of you who are history lovers or astrology students. For example, in the extended version of this episode, we look at the work of Stan Barker, an astrologer who wrote an entire book on the Neptune cycle and examined two previous transits of Neptune through Aries in detail. His conclusions on the transit are sobering to say the least, and we consider what they might tell us about what's coming in the US and the world in the coming years. But signing up also gives you access to The War Room, a private forum hosting a growing community of fantastic astrologers and all around interesting people who are discussing the things I talk about on this show and the astrology of the world as it happens. The advantage of a forum is that unlike here today, gone tomorrow, social media, it's really easy to find old discussions on interesting topics and then read and learn from them. In other words, on the forum, we're building a library of knowledge that you can get access to. And last but not least, you'll also get access to regular live streams. These sessions include exclusive presentations from yours truly and a Q&A session in which you can ask me pretty much whatever you like. You can watch them all in full on the website right now. You can sign up for a month and cancel at any time, but signing up for a year will give you discounted membership and I have a hell of a lot more compelling content planned for you, so there's always that. 
Thanks for listening and let's get back to the video. We tend to think of Neptune as a planet concerned with the numinous, the ideal, and that which lies beyond this mortal coil. Saturn, on the other hand, is the planet we associate with concrete reality and enduring structures in the material world. But these planets have more in common than you might think. In ancient astrology, Saturn held many of the roles that Neptune currently holds, uh, especially with respect to everything that exists beyond ordinary consciousness. So in ancient astrology, Saturn as the dimmest and most distant planet sits on the threshold between the realm of the gods and everything that's sort of numinous and beyond. For example, that's why in ancient astrology you have Saturn associated with melancholics, mystics, monks, contemplatives, astrologers, people who sort of sit at the edge of the city walls between the forest and the civilization. When I think about Neptune in relation to traditional Saturn, what I really think of is everything that goes sort of beyond that limit is very Neptunian. I remember Richard Tarnas saying, Neptune is the archetype of the archetypal in the sense that when we connect with the archetypal in that, I guess, ancient sort of platonic sense of there being these numinous forms that exist somewhere in the mind of God or the universe or whatever, there's a sense of, of timelessness that kind of pours in and seeps through the boundaries of your everyday life and so, somehow permeates and makes numinous your experience. I think that's why a lot of people love astrology. And I, I would say that from the standpoint of our modern outer planets, that's thoroughly a Neptunian kind of experience. There is an archetypal tension that exists between what is beyond Saturn and what is within Saturn's bounds. And Neptune participates in that tension in really subtle but important ways that we have to always pay attention to. And on the one hand, the tension of that Neptunian pulling for the beyond creates great creative outpourings and it can fill us with a sense of the spirit here in the world. On the other hand, it can create for some people a tremendous sense of intolerance for this world in the same way that, you know, Saturn was associated with melancholics in the ancient world and their inability to withstand the mundane realities of life. So sometimes Neptune is at work in trying to bring us a sense of imminence and peace with the way that the world is, as much as sometimes we need to move beyond the mundane shackles of this world, like go beyond materialism and find meditation or something like that. So it's it's got this tension that it works at the same time, which is why you always hear people say things like Neptune is illusion, Neptune is fantasy. On the other hand, Neptune is romance, Neptune is spirituality. That, that, that dichotomy is sort of coming from that. Neptune was discovered on September the 24th, 1846 and it was named for the Roman god of the sea. And so one of the best places to start if you're trying to understand Neptune is by considering its oceanic quality. What does water do? Water runs and pools together. You think of, for example, of the word religion, one that Neptune has a lot of associations with. And if I'm correct, the Latin is something like religio, which means to reconnect like, a, like ligaments that have been severed. In a sense, the most basic archetypal aim of religion is to g bring back a feeling of connection where there's been disconnection or yoga to join or yoke things together. So I think that one expression of our, of our desire for union is to seek out pools of commonality with other people that are joined by things that we are strongly identified with on an emotional level or an ideological level. And so we see Neptune's influence in popular culture and in political movements and ideologies, things that unite people through their shared experience of archetypes, ideals, and images. And so over the course of Neptune's 164 year cycle, we see shifts in these areas as Neptune's influence is refracted through the influence of the 12 signs. In 2011 and 12, Neptune transitioned from Aquarius into Pisces, the last sign of the zodiac. And so understanding this sign can tell us a lot about the last 12 years. In traditional astrology, the meanings of the signs were derived from certain fundamental qualities inherent to them. These included the gender, element, and modality of each sign, and several systems of rulership that assigned dominion over the signs to particular planets, the primary two being domicile and exaltation. This is very different to the more jazz-like approach used by modern astrologers. Not to be a curmudgeon, but it's worth mentioning that 
Modern astrologers are assigning rulerships in a completely different way than ancient astrologers did. Ancient astrologers had a very rigorous, multi-leveled sort of mandala of philosophical reasoning behind everything. And today we're making really keen and I think smart and valid symbolic correlations, but it's just a different approach to assigning rulerships to outer planets. So I don't personally use outer planetary rulerships, but I don't condemn anyone who does. Modern astrologers give rulership of Pisces to Neptune, but the traditional ruler of the sign was Jupiter. At a superficial level, both the planet Neptune and the sign Pisces evoke water, but there are deeper reasons why it makes sense to link Neptune to the last sign of the zodiac. From the traditional perspective, if you think about Jupiter, as basically the planet that is within the material world supposed to bring down the ideal governance of the cosmos into human experience and society. So truth, beauty, harmony, justice, all as cooperative features of the universe from the ancient imagination. Jupiter is the one who's supposed to give us institutions of law, institutions of government, institutions of education and religion, all ideally to uphold unity, virtue, and to put human beings in touch with the greater truths that hold everything together. Of course, I think it's not at all lost on the ancient Greeks who imagined Zeus, the Greek correlate of, of Jupiter, as constantly failing at that job. <laughs> like, like he's messing up all the time. That's because in this world, the institutions of our that are ideally holding things together are also an approximation because the material world is by its nature a sort of reflection of the ideal, but it, it approximates but doesn't perfectly mirror in the same way that like a tree on the surface of the water is sort of shimmering and moving. It's an approximation of the tree. But my point in saying all of this is that when you have a sign like Pisces, that's primary rulership is a feminine Jupiter. You're really talking about the ability for us to connect on the level of feelings and relationships to that higher sense of truth. So exactly what we were talking about with respect to Neptune and the need for collective experience that draws us closer toward ideals. Whether that's your church community, if you go to a church, or it's your yoga studio, if you go to a yoga studio, that collective feeling of getting close or approximating the highest ideal. Pisces has so much to do with that because not only is it the feminine domicile of Jupiter, which implies a relational Jupiter, but it's also the exaltation of Venus where we find Venus reaching her highest potential in something like agape and human love for one another and compassion and forgiveness and things like that. So it's it's a lovely sign in the sense of how it, there's a lot in those two planets in this watery temple. There's problems, of course, with the sign too, though. Insofar as anything falls short of the idealism of exalted Venus and Jupiter in this feminine temple, there can be real intolerance and impatience and restlessness. If we aren't living in something that's close to perfection and it doesn't feel very blissful and uplifting and connected, then there can be tremendous dejection and depression and drug use and um, like a, a feeling of nihilism and pointlessness. And it's funny because the other sign that shares that quality is Sagittarius, the other Jupiter ruled sign. You'll find that the Jupiter ruled signs insofar as you always have to reconcile with the way this world will fall short of the Jupiterian vision is the opposite tendencies of nihilism, recklessness, destruction, pointlessness, existentialism, a sense of nothing means anything anymore, that creeps in as a kind of polar opposite that's pulling when it comes to having to reconcile with the way the world is compared to what we, we kind of hope or think it can be. Now, in 2011 and 12, Neptune transitioned into Pisces, and that had big implications for cultural trends, collective dreams, and visions of the ideal. We've seen big changes to collective ideals over the past 12 years, and they've shifted in a direction that reflects the sign of Pisces. When I think of the sign of Pisces, I also think a lot about our collective experience of pain. Because the, the greatest like fly in the ointment for the ideal spiritual experience is pain and suffering and mortality. And one of the things that I've noticed about the Neptune and Pisces era has been this tremendous emphasis on the reality of trauma and suffering. In a way, trauma has been normalized. Everyone uses the language of trauma now. And 
I think that's on one hand, that's a really good thing, right? Because now we recognize, hey, human experience comes with trauma and suffering and everybody has a little different version of it. On the other hand, intolerance for suffering leads to just this explosion of ways of trying to address and eradicate the experience of suffering. When you start seeing like nobody should ever have to feel pain, nobody should ever have to feel suffering, nobody should ever have to touch on traumas from the past. And we also go searching for the identifications with collective bodies of suffering, um, whether it's history, ancestry, race, uh, ethnicity, religious background, whatever it is. On the one hand, Neptune opens up this gateway in Pisces for us to connect with collective suffering, which is a very good thing because then we can lay down the cross and feel like it's not just me. On the other hand, the other thing that I've noticed is if we get overly identified with a collective and a collective story of trauma or, or suffering, that's also very problematic because the salvation is always sort of unique and it's in the soul and it's, it's within and it has to do with individuating. And so there's this way in which we can only save ourselves through a process of individuation. And that requires that we hold tension and some kind of resistance to being too identified with a collective story of our pain. At the same time, we can't ignore it. I feel like that tension has been really amplified through Neptune's stay in Pisces. I've previously described social networks like Facebook, Instagram, and so forth as oceanic in the sense that they place everyone in the same domain. They erase boundaries and they allow people from across the world to communicate with each other instantly. In that sense, as well as their tendency to promote illusory and idealized versions of reality, they're Neptunian. And I think we can explain some of the major cultural trends of the past 12 years or so as reactions to that boundaryless online world that social media has produced. Some responded to the shift by embracing ever finer grades of identity and an ethos of protection against offense. Others took almost the opposite approach, making a virtue of offensiveness itself. We've also seen huge polarization, especially in terms of cultural attitudes. Remember, Pisces is a double-bodied sign. We've also seen big shifts in our understanding of the true contours of reality. We've seen an explosion in magic, mysticism, and more Gnostic and even conspiratorial visions of the world. When you have Neptune in a, in a sign of Jupiter, whether it's Sagittarius or it's Pisces, the question of what we can rely on as true and what is virtuous and what defines the good, not just for me, but collectively, comes into question. One of the really profound things that I've noticed over the past decade has been this growing, increasing sense of like, we're not so naive. We can tell that there are more things that are happening and that are true and that are real than we current we, we believed previously. I remember, for example, at the outset of Neptune into Pisces, I was, you know, on a national book tour educating people about the use of psychedelic substances for therapy and for healing. This has grown to the point where while Neptune was in Pisces, we have seen a lot of legalization of medical marijuana or just recreational use of marijuana. There's much more acceptance now of things like microdosing with mushrooms, all sorts of things where what we know to be true or what we know to be real beyond the scope of ordinary consciousness has grown tremendously. And that makes sense for a Jupiter ruled sign. Okay, so on the one hand, we're sort of opening the floodgates and saying like, I remember at the outset of Neptune and Pisces, you know, Edward Snowden was in the news. Like there is more here than meets the eye. There's much more broad acceptance of the reality of things that are happening beneath the radar, right? It's like people are much more attuned to the fact that your phone listens to you, the government isn't telling you the truth all of the time. Uh, not that people didn't know those things before, but I just noticed how pervasive that awareness has become since Neptune's been in Pisces. I would say there's also been a huge amount of distortion. Part of this may have been due to the effects of social media because it gives people easy access to voices and information that contradict official narratives. And the result of that can be anything from a healthy, newfound skepticism and realism to paranoia and delusion. This is what Robert Anton Wilson referred to as chapel perilous, and more people than ever have found themselves navigating this treacherous territory. The change in the US government's approach to talking about the UFO phenomenon is one of the more striking examples of this trend. After decades of denying that anything strange was afoot in the skies, in 2017 the Pentagon released footage of what it now calls UAPs. 
And so it now seems to have shifted to a policy of admitting that the phenomenon is in some sense real and trying to shape the narrative around that story. And this is the kind of shift that has people thinking, well, if UFOs are real and the government lied about it, what else are they hiding? I think there's been a long, slow developing sense of there's more real than we see here, but also tremendous distortions that come along the way. It's like once you open yourself up to subtle truths that can't be seen, which is very Neptune in a Jupiter ruled sign, now we also have the potential for delusions and conspiracy. But this Piscean era is almost at an end. And when Neptune changes sign, ideals, ideologies, and the cultural imagination are gonna change once again. Neptune will make its first ingress into the sign of Aries on March the 30th, 2025. It'll stay there until October the 22nd, 2025, when it will leave the sign again. It'll return to the sign for good on January the 26th, 2026. And it won't make its first ingress into Taurus until 2038. So we have a good 13 or 14 years of Neptune and Aries approaching. We have quite the transition in front of us because we're moving from a double-bodied feminine water sign that's the exaltation of Venus and the domicile of a feminine Jupiter, and we're moving straight into masculine, Mars, Sun, tropical. Like, it's a very different vibe. Now, Neptune is a house guest in the Temple of the Ram, which is the domicile of Mars and the exaltation of the Sun. So you're going to get a Neptune that has to behave like Neptune, but is now also behaving through the lens of a combination of Mars and the Sun. Very heroic, for example. As with any transit, there will be positive and negative ways that it will manifest in the world. We've already seen how that was true of Neptune in Pisces, and it will be true of Neptune in Aries in the same way. On the light side, you know, when you put Neptune in a pioneering Mars-ruled sign that's very heroic, likes to start things, is very ambitious, and truly carries the quality of light. Neptune in Pisces is very misty, you know? <laughs> Neptune in Aries, very clear, you know, like a sunrise coming up and, and cresting over the mountains or something. So when you have that and you put that together, you think about, okay, if there's an ideal, that you're gonna have someone who is going to crusade on behalf of the ideal and advocate and fight and be a hero on behalf of some greater Neptunian vision of clarity, truth, light, purpose, whatever it may be. So, for example, Swami Vivekananda was born when Neptune was in the sign of Aries, and he is responsible for bringing yoga, among some others, to the West. So he brings this valuable system of spiritual science to the West as a matter of feeling called as a kind of yogic missionary. That's a really beautiful, promising sign, I think, because many, many people in the West have benefited tremendously from yoga, mindfulness, meditation, all of which a pioneering personality like Vivekananda initiated. So you have stuff like that. On the other hand, you have like just to flip it, the same kind of spiritual ambition when it's fueled by delusion. And you also have Mars and the sun, which can be uh, grandiose, arrogant, and like violent. We also have people like Julius Caesar, born with Neptune and Aries, starts a civil war, forces his way to power, declares himself ruler and dictator for life. You know, like that's a little scary. And, you know, I'm not getting so much into politics, but dare I say that we do have some figures like that around us in the world right now. So that's a little scary to think about Neptune going into Aries with that kind of delusional sense of ultimate power that can come with that signature. But, you know, Gandhi was born with Neptune in Aries. He was a political and spiritual leader in the Indian independence movement. He, by the way, was assassinated and so was Julius Caesar. And there's this interesting pattern with Neptune in Aries of the sacrificial lamb. Rams were often sacrificed in the ancient world. And so you have these tremendous spiritual figures or these figures of great ideal power, but they are often also like sacrificed. Like there's this theme of assassination and the death or martyrdom that comes in with some of these figures as well. Aries is the first sign of the zodiac. It has to do with birth and that moment of severance from the mother. Cutting and severing is one of Mars's specialities. And so this may be one reason it was given rulership of the first sign. So we can expect a new emphasis on pioneering and doing new things. Aries is such an innovative sign. It's like underestimated in terms of its inventive qualities. There are a number of examples of incredibly innovative people and things that are happening 
in other fields too, like Marie Curie. She's the first woman to win a Nobel Prize and did all of this groundbreaking research, if I remember correctly, on radioactivity. And Henry Ford is making automobiles accessible to the masses and sports, too, which I thought was really cool. Like the Queensberry Rules were published, which established the modern rules of boxing, the National Association Professional Baseball, which leads to the Major League Baseball. And then some of the first like tremendous mountaineering accomplishments so it's kind of exciting to see that, you know, because I think once you hear once you hear that this is associated with the Civil War, immediately you can feel like Neptune and Aries is just going to bring like violence and bloodshed or something. But I think it brings a quality of pioneering and aspiration that's also like remarkable. That's interesting to think about in 2024, given that we tend to feel these days like we know it all. or We've seen it all before. The surface of the Earth has been mapped. We've surveyed the solar system. And so at a time like this, what might it mean to go forth and pioneer? What new territory and new realms might we discover and explore? Well, perhaps we don't know quite as much about the world as we like to think we do. OK, so as someone who is, you know, uh, obviously a decade of my life was spent working in very intentional ritual settings with uh, psychedelic medicines. Um, and ayahuasca being the main one, but also um, the second one probably being mushrooms. I think that we're only at the beginning of our awareness of how sentient and powerful plants are. We don't even really understand the genesis of life on our planet and how intricately connected it is to forms of plant life that are like if you take them into your body and you dialogue with them in an altered state of consciousness, you realize that these plants are they're conscious, you know, and they're they're elders in a sense as well. So that's just one little example. I'm not trying to get too literal about it, but I just can't help but think that some of the unexplored dimensions of life on Earth may have to do with what we think we know about other forms of life and what we're about to learn about other forms of life and plant life in particular comes to my mind. This is something that I'm very passionate about. My wife's an herbalist, so, you know. We could also imagine that perhaps technology will create new vistas of digital territory to explore. And perhaps there are new spiritual realms to explore too. And then there are the guys that want to go to Mars. Neptune can also tell us about the kind of figures who are deemed worthy of respect in the culture of the time. Mars is the god of war. And so we could imagine that Neptune and Aries will see a new emphasis on heroes and heroism. Those who bravely fight for what they believe in, whether literally or figuratively. And those who pioneer and bring the truly new into the world are likely to earn our respect in the coming years. When I think about Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, he had some Aries signatures in his chart. And I think you're going to see that the journey of the hero, like Luke Skywalker, that, that just that that archetypal sense of life being about a, an individual journey of heroic discovery, that I think that will be amplified in a way that is really runs very contrary to Neptune and Pisces, where there's so much emphasis on collective identification and trauma. Aries is a sign associated with the unmediated discovery and experience of the self. With that in mind, it seems fitting that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation came in 1863 with Neptune in the early part of this sign. A little earlier in 1861, the year Neptune made its first Aries ingress, at the other side of the world, Emperor Alexander II of Russia issued what's called the Edict of Emancipation, in which some 23 million feudal serfs, essentially workers bound to work the land, received their freedom. So we can take hope from this, I think. An Aries drive towards freedom will likely be in the air in the coming period. Of course, there are still literal slaves in the world. And besides that, perhaps more people will strive for freedom from more subtle forms of bondage. On a less happy note, Aries is a fire sign, and so we're likely to see the theme of fire influence the collective imagination. When Neptune was in Aries last, so we had the Great Fire of Boston that destroyed much of the city of Boston, and then we had the Great Fire of Chicago, which burned for three days and devastated like most of the city of Chicago. And there were a number of other tremendous events where there was this moment of reflection from what I've gathered and, and studied where human beings were going like, holy cow, the greatest American forest fire in American history, the Peshtigo fire of 1871. And that was a, a moment from what I read that made people more collectively aware of the dramatic violent impact that human 
civilization could have on nature and vice versa, that nature could devastate human endeavors. So one thing that I think Neptune does is it also draws our attention to realities that are bigger than ourselves as humans, like the gods, the archetypes. I wouldn't be surprised with Neptune in Aries if we were also drawn to larger environmental realities, which could extend even beyond our planet. Like while Pluto's in Aquarius as well, I think about the potential for this to just ignite our awareness of the fact that the Earth is more than we think it is, that the cosmos is more than we think it is, and for that to have this very illuminating effect that could also catalyze a lot of new thinking and new developments. But there's a complicating factor to all this, and that's the fact that Neptune won't be making this transition from Pisces to Aries alone. It'll be accompanied by its more curmudgeonly spiritual companion, Saturn. Saturn and Neptune currently share the sign of Pisces and are getting ready to conjoin in early 26 in the first degree of Aries. We won't go too much into Saturn-Neptune conjunctions in this episode. It's something I've talked about many times before, including in this episode with SJ Anderson, and I have more on that subject coming up soon. Once Neptune enters Aries, it will be soon accompanied by the concretizing, pressurizing, crystallizing force of Saturn. But Saturn is considered to be in the state of debilitation known as fall in Aries. Planets in their fall often depict like being dealt a shit hand. But what I've observed in the lives of my clients is that just as regularly as you see someone being dealt a shit hand, there's nowhere to go for a fallen planet but up. Whereas for an exalted planet, there's nowhere to go but down. And you always have to be careful of that tension with an exalted planet. William Lilly, great horary master, said that exalted planets overestimating themselves set themselves up for the fall. Similarly, fallen planets are about rising up from a condition of real hardship or misfortune. Saturn brings a heaviness and a certain seriousness wherever you find it. And in Aries, it brings that sense to Aries themes like initiation, freedom, pioneering, bravery, and so forth. Saturn in Aries can signify serious issues with the theme of authority. If Aries is the just be yourself sign, Saturn in Aries reveals the extremes of that way of being and tests its upper and lower bounds. And so it can bring tyrants and anarchists, oppressors, and freedom fighters. In the lives of my clients, I will often see, for example, Saturn and Aries in the fourth house. Your dad was a violent, abusive alcoholic, but you rose up to better things because you got out of the house and you went through the process of dating your dad and then realizing you were doing so and then choosing a partner who is peaceful and kind and that you get along with. And you worked for bosses who were domineering. But then you started going to Al-Anon, a 12-step program for family members of alcoholics, and you started reconfiguring your career. So there's something about like compensating for and rising up in the face of whatever the fallen status of the planet is that's implied within fallen planets in their dignities. So Saturn and Aries, the state of feeling weak, the state of feeling like you have maybe no discipline or no strength or an initial state of feeling dominated or maybe even in psychologically speaking, you start off being kind of a bully. But whatever the case is, like all of the, the worst things you can imagine for Saturn and Aries may be like the initial place that Neptune and Aries finds itself. We have to rise up against a tyrannical oppressor. We have to rise up against things that are trying to push us down in ways that are unfair and dominant. Again, you could spin it politically. Whoever feels like they've gotten the short end of the stick and like they're being pushed down by someone or something that's unfair or immoral or lacking in the religious qualities or virtues or whatever will likely be trying to rise up and press up against the overarching tyrannical authority figure. But it's just as easy for someone on the left or the right to feel that way about each other right now. That's what's problematic about it. So the obvious question here is, what does Neptune shift into Aries tell us about what might happen after this year's election? I don't personally think that if this candidate gets elected or that candidate gets elected, that it somehow negates the potential for some really difficult things coming immediately after either result with Neptune and Saturn going into Aries. Because it's so divided, you could see schisms and splits psychically or literally being amplified or happening directly after either result. That's how I feel right now. When you have this Jupiter-Saturn square that we're going through in a Mercury-ruled sign and a Jupiter-ruled sign, the question about truth is front and center. 
like what is real, what is true. Regardless of where I stand and what candidate I support, what I see just archetypally speaking is two parties calling each other's liars, telling each other that the worst case political disaster in all of history is going to happen if either should get elected, that you can't trust either person, that what they're saying isn't real. So when Neptune goes into Aries, I think it moves beyond the scope of what is real and what is true to doing things. And it and you will do things based on what you believe to be true. And so I think we're about to move beyond what is real, who can you trust, into I know what I believe and I'm going to do something, which can be just as delusional, but there's there's less room for questioning. I don't know, there's some promise in that. There's also reasons to be a little freaked out by that. But it's hard to avoid an uncomfortable fact, one that we've skirted around a little so far in this episode. And that's that the last time Neptune was in Aries coincided closely with the American Civil War. And its transit through Aries will coincide with Uranus's transit through Gemini. Now, as is well known by now in astrological circles, every time Uranus has transited through Gemini since the founding of the US, the country has experienced a transformational armed conflict that fundamentally changed its character. Obviously, the big one is that as Neptune enters Aries in 1861, you have the American Civil War getting started. And many were fighting from the standpoint of radically different beliefs about freedom, slavery, and so forth. And as much as I just want to paint that as a just war with a just cause, because that's how I see it, it's also true that people who were fighting in the South believed they were fighting for God's cause. That's lost on us that people in wars usually feel that way on both sides. And so the elephant in the room is the question, will that happen again? In the extended version of this video, available exclusively for World Astrology Report members, we're going to consider that question. And we're going to do that by examining the work of the American astrologer Stan Barker, who wrote a lengthy historical study of the Neptune cycle called The Signs of the Times. The book was published in 1984 and it's out of print now, but if you're interested in astrology and American history, then I strongly recommend you get hold of a secondhand copy. In the book, Barker charts American history through the lens of two cycles of Neptune and its movement through the 12 signs. And his thesis is that American culture and history is profoundly shaped by Neptune, more so than other countries. Here's what he says about Neptune in Aries. When the sign of the times is Aries, we will experience a fierce and bloody conflict with plenty of burning as well, fought in opposition to a union and because of a head of state who, in the end, may wind up being sacrificed. If you want to watch that extended video, then head to my website, www.worldastrologyreport.com now and sign up as a member. That's it for this episode. I'd like to give a huge thanks to Adam for joining me. You can find him here on YouTube. Just search for Adam Ellenbass. People can check out my work on YouTube. I've got a channel like you. It's Nightlight Astrology. I publish uh, weekly content Monday through Fridays year round, just reflecting on the archetypal combinations of the planets in the sky. We've got some monthly horoscopes and a big monthly overview we do, but it's, it's mostly geared toward people looking for personal and spiritual psychological integration of the archetypes day to day. On my website, you can find we've got uh, first, second, third year programs in Hellenistic astrology, a one year course in horary astrology, a total beginner's course. Like if you're very, very brand new, there's a short beginner's course we have. So lots of resources for people who want to study and learn more. And then uh, like you can follow me on Instagram or whatever that all that too. I've taken three of Adam's courses myself, and I can honestly say they were excellent and an essential part of my astrological education. So if you're looking to study astrology seriously, look no further. Now, if you found our discussions of Neptune in Pisces interesting, I have more for you. I mentioned earlier that Neptune in Pisces coincided with the reign of the smartphone and the image-focused social network. And I have a whole video that you can watch right now in which we look at how social media changed with Neptune in Pisces, what effects it had on the collective, and how it's likely to change into something very different in the near future. Thanks, and see you next time.